The second question is, what are these functions? Hmm. Well, they can be anything. Let's see what's typically used. We'll go on to the next mini lecture, which is Gaussian basis functions. In principle, the fitting functions can be anything we like. They could be sine functions, cosine functions. Um, by the way, if we use sines and cosines, we would have something called a Fourier decomposition. But in practice, um, sines and cosines are not good functions to model molecular systems because they don't really look like the orbitals in the real molecule, whatever that means. Um, what we would really like to use is Slater type functions, like in the hydrogen atom. They're exponential functions, but doing integrals with those exponential functions is a little bit difficult. It turns out uh, Frank Boyce proposed um, from Cambridge that it's actually better to use Cartesian Gaussian functions, well just Gaussian functions. Sometimes they're spherical but the Cartesian ones are easier to understand. And this is what they look like. Here's, the, here's a Cartesian Gaussian function. It's a function of R, three-dimensional space, and it has a position where it's centered, capital RA. It depends on three integers n and it has an exponent. So here's the Gaussian function. It's an exponential of minus times alpha, the Gaussian exponent, times R minus capital RA. This is the center of the Gaussian. So you can see if R was equal to RA, this would be zero. So the Gaussian is actually a maximum at the position RA. It's a Gaussian function in three-dimensional space, positioned at position RA. And the whole thing is multiplied by a monomial term. This monomial term is just x minus rx to some power, y minus ry to some power, z minus rz to some power. I've used 1, 2, 3 because x, y, z is annoying. Uh, when you do math mathematics, it's easier to have 1, 2, 3 because you can sum i equals 1, 2, 3. Otherwise, you would have to do sum x, y, z. Okay, so that's the exponent. So this Gaussian function depends on a series of variables. And those are the functions we use. What, what are these uh, numbers alpha? We can use any, any sets of these things. Um, and typically we use several Gaussians to fit uh, our molecular orbitals. Now there's certain names given to these functions. Uh, if the powers n are all equal to zero, so if all of these are zero, anything to the power zero is one. So if all of that disappears, we have an S-type Gaussian. If any one of these ends is one and the remaining terms are zero, we have a P-type basis function. For example, if the X term here, R, X minus Rx to the power one, if that was not zero, if that was one and these were zero, we would have a PX function. Likewise, PY if N2 is 1 and the remaining are 0, and uh, PZ if N3 is 1 and the remaining are 0. So that's P. And uh, if two of these numbers, uh, if the sum of these numbers is equal to 2, mm -hmm. we have a D type. If the sum of these numbers is equal to 3, we have an F type, and so on. Turns out there are six D functions XX, YY, ZZ, XY, XZ, YZ. That's six. And you can count up, there are 10 f-type functions. For example, xxx, yyy, zzz, xxy. By the way, zxx would be the same as xxz because the product term doesn't matter which way you do it. You can, you can swap the z into the front and put the two x's at the back. It's still the same monomial. So xxz would be the same as zzx. Anyway, there's 10 distinct ones for the Fs. And we use them to fit the molecular orbitals, which are over here, with these coefficients. See you later. Hi there, welcome to Chemistry 3007 Approximate Wave Functions at the University of Western Australia. In the last mini lecture, we were talking about 
linear combinations of basis functions, which we use to fit the molecular orbitals and change their shapes. But if you were listening carefully, you may have been disturbed about something. What about the spin coordinate? What about the spin coordinate? You know, we talked about spin. We said a lot about spin being a coordinate. And then finally, our basis functions are only functions of x, y, z, our Gaussian basis functions. What about the spin coordinate? We need to introduce the spin coordinate into our Gaussian functions. And we do that like this. Here's our Gaussian, 3D Gaussian function of x, y, z. And we multiply it by a spin function, either alpha or beta. Here's the spin coordinate. Remember, the spin coordinate depends on theta and phi. And there's two of them. One can be plus half or minus half. In chemistry, just to make things more complicated, we call this alpha and beta. I don't know why, because I don't know. So finally, we have a function over here of x, y, z, and a function of the spin, either alpha or beta, of this coordinate. And this is called a Gaussian spin basis function. It's a spin basis function because it has not only space, but spin. All right, now when we come to making matrix elements of this, we need to do integrals, 3D integrals, of course, but also integrals over the spin. Now, it doesn't really matter what these spin functions look like because when we come to do integrals, we just need to be able to integrate them with each other. And so all we need to know is the fact that an alpha integrated with itself is one, and that beta integrated with itself is one and that the alpha and beta functions are orthogonal. Alpha integrated with beta and beta integrated with alpha. Integrated over the spin coordinate is zero. With these facts, we can get all the integrals we need. So there's two types of spin basis functions, just to summarize. There's the G alpha spin basis function, which is an F basis function spatial times an alpha spin function, and a G beta spin basis function, which is an F spatial function, could be Gaussian, it could be sine, whatever, times a beta spin function. All right, now this gives rise to several different kinds of approximations, depending on what spin basis functions we use. So the molecular spin orbitals from the previous slide, the previous lecture, I wrote them down slightly wrongly. I'm sorry about that, but I had to introduce you a little bit slowly into this kind of thing. So here's the alpha uh, spin orbital, uh, alpha spin molecular orbital, and it's equal to a G alpha spin basis function times uh, an alpha set of molecular spin orbital coefficients, C alpha. These are just numbers. These are spin basis functions, and we're trying to find the shapes of these spin basis functions. And just like the alpha one, we have a corresponding beta one with C beta coefficients. Okay, so we have actually two sets of coefficients. By the way, this spin molecular orbital, spin, spin orbitals, molecular spin orbital splits into a spatial one times an alpha function, because remember there's an alpha in this G, and the beta one splits into a spatial spin orbital times a beta. So basically, we call this a pro essentially just a separation of variables. Gosh, we like that approximation in chemistry, don't we? So there are two sets of molecular spin orbital coefficients. Now we have a choice. It turns out that in the restricted approximation, which is the one we use most common, and which works for even electron systems, uh, most systems in chemistry are even electron systems because radicals tend to be, they do exist, but they're a little bit more reactive. I'll turn the lights off, so I'll just stand up. It's annoying. In the restricted approximation, um, we choose these alpha coefficients to be equal. So for an even number of electrons, uh, we can make these coefficients the same, and that's called the restricted approximation. We don't have to, but we do. And it turns out that even if we try and make the orbitals different, 
um, they often end up being the same anyway. So in other words, electrons end up being in the same spin orbitals that actually leads to the lowest energy situation, the most optimum spin orbitals, uh, when the electrons want to be near the nuclei. So that's the restricted case with an even number of electrons. With an odd number of electrons, it's different. With an odd number of electrons, or even with an even, um, it turns out that the alpha coefficients prefer to be different numerically than the beta ones. So this is called unrestricted. Unrestricted because they're not restricted to be the same. And there's a third approximation where uh, the orbitals are neither alpha nor beta. The final possibility is called the general approximation where the molecular spin orbitals are not assumed to be of either alpha or beta type. So here's a molecular spin orbital. Notice there's no alpha or beta on the top of it. That's because it's made up of a sum of G alpha spin basis functions times C alpha times G beta uh, times C beta. And these two are not the same and there is a C alpha and a C beta for every spin orbital. So this is a bit strange. Every orbital has an alpha part and a beta part. Wow. So the electrons aren't alpha or beta. Their spins can be pointing in any direction. It turns out that we need this approximation in relativity where there are spin orbit interactions and the magnetic fields caused by electrons spinning around the molecules actually causes their spins to twist a little bit. Um, and that's when we would use this approximation. That's when it's used most of the time. So there we have it. We have spin basis functions making molecular spin orbitals. We have the restricted case for even electron systems. We have the unrestricted approximation for restricted and unrestricted. Most important for unrestricted and the general approximation. See you later.